This is day number three of lectures on the divine properties, and we're looking at divine eternity. Let's turn it over to Dr. Craig. Thank you, Cameron. So today we turn to a study of divine eternity. God declares the prophet Isaiah is the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. But being a prophet and not a philosophical theologian, Isaiah did not pause to reflect upon the nature of divine eternity. Minimally, to be eternal means to exist without beginning and end. To say that God is eternal means minimally that he never came into being and will never go out of being. To exist eternally is to exist permanently. There are, however, at least two ways in which something could exist eternally. One way would be to exist omnitemporally throughout infinite time. In this case, God would have an immemorial and everlasting temporal duration. This seems to have been Aristotle's view, for God, as the first unmoved mover in Aristotle's cosmology, is the cause of the co-eternal motion of the spheres. The other way in which a being could exist eternally would be by existing timelessly. In this case, God would completely transcend time, having neither temporal location nor temporal extension. He would simply exist in an undifferentiated, timeless state. This was the view of Plotinus, who held that the One is strictly timeless. Under the influence of Neoplatonism, Christian theologians like Augustine, Boethius, Anselm, and Aquinas held that God transcends time and is therefore timeless despite his being active in the world. Now, as is our practice, we want to look first then at biblical data concerning divine eternity to see what guidance they provide. Since we take scripture as our primary guide in theological matters, the initial question we must ask is, does the biblical teaching on divine eternity favor either one of these views? The question turns out to be surprisingly difficult to answer. On the one hand, it's indisputable that the biblical writers typically portray God as engaged in temporal activities including foreknowing the future and remembering the past. And when they speak directly of God's eternal existence, they do so in terms of beginning less and end less temporal duration. For example, Psalm 92, before the mountains were brought forth or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. After surveying the biblical data on divine eternity, Alan Paget concludes, and I quote, the Bible knows nothing of a timeless divine eternity in the traditional sense. Defenders of divine timelessness might suggest that the biblical authors lack the conceptual categories for enunciating a doctrine of divine timelessness so that their temporal descriptions of God need not be taken literally. But Paget cites 2 Enoch 65 verses 6 and 7 as evidence that the conception of timeless existence was not beyond the reach of biblical writers. Uh, 2 Enoch says, And then the whole creation, visible and invisible, which the Lord has created, shall come to an end. Then each person will go to the Lord's great judgment, and then all time will perish, and afterward there will be neither years, nor months, nor days, nor hours. They will be dissipated, and after that they will not be reckoned. Such a passage gives us reason to think that the biblical authors 
had they wished to, could have formulated a doctrine of divine timelessness. Paul Helm raises a more subtle objection to the inference that the authors of Scripture, in describing God in temporal terms, intended to teach that God is temporal. He claims that the biblical writers lacked the reflective context for formulating a doctrine of divine eternity. That is to say, the issue, like uh, the issue of geocentrism, for example, had either never come up for explicit consideration or else simply fell outside their interests. Consider the parallel case of God's relationship to space. Just as the biblical writers describe God in temporal terms, so they describe him in spatial terms as well, and you see the passage is quoted there. Yet most theologians would not take Scripture to teach that God is literally a spatial being. The authors of Scripture were not concerned to craft a metaphysical doctrine of God's relation to space, and parity would require us to say the same of time as well. Paget considers Helm's point to be well taken. He says, the biblical authors were not interested in philosophical speculation about eternity, and thus the intellectual context for discussing this matter may simply not have existed at that time. Thus, the biblical descriptions of God as temporal may not be determinative for a doctrine of divine eternity. Moreover, it must be said that the biblical data are not so one-sidedly in favor of divine temporality as Paget would have us believe. Johannes Schmidt, whose Ewigkeitsbegriff im Alten Testament, or the concept of eternity in the Old Testament, Paget calls the longest and most thorough book on the concept of eternity in the Old Testament, argues for a biblical doctrine of divine timelessness on the basis of creation texts like Genesis 1-1 and Proverbs 8, 22 and 23. Paget dismisses Schmidt's contention with the comment, neither of these texts teaches or implies that time began with creation or indeed say anything about time or eternity. Well, it seems to me this summary dismissal is all too quick. Genesis 1.1, which is likely neither a subordinate clause nor a summary title, states, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. According to James Barr, this absolute beginning, taken in conjunction with the expression, and there was evening, and there was morning one day, indicating the first day may very well be intended to teach that the beginning of the universe was not simply the beginning of uh, the physical world, but the beginning of time itself, and that consequently God may be thought of as timeless. <clears throat> this conclusion is rendered all the more plausible when the Genesis account of creation is read against the backdrop of ancient Egyptian cosmogony. Egyptian cosmogony includes the idea that creation took place at the first time. Analyzing the relevant texts, John Currid takes both the Egyptian and the Hebrew cosmogonies to involve the notion that the moment of creation is the beginning of time. Moreover, certain New Testament authors may be taken to construe Genesis 1-1 as referring to the beginning of time. The most striking New Testament reflection on Genesis 1-1 is, of course, John 1-1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Here, the uncreated logos, the source of all created things, was already with God and was God at the moment of creation. It's not hard to interpret this passage in terms of the words timeless unity with God, nor would it be anachronistic to do so 
given the first century Jewish philosopher Philo's doctrine of the divine logos and Philo's holding that time begins with creation. Significantly, certain New Testament passages also seem to affirm a beginning of time. This would imply just the same sort of timelessness before the creation of the world, which Paget sees in Second Enoch after the end of the world. For example, we read in Jude 25, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now, and forever. Propantas tu ionas, kai nun, kai es pantas tu ionas. The passage contemplates an everlasting future duration, but affirms a beginning to past time and implies God's existence using an almost inevitable façon de parler before time began. Similar expressions are found in two intriguing passages in the pastoral epistles. In Titus 1, 2, and 3, in a passage laden with temporal language, we read of those chosen by God in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before age-long time, prachronon ionion, but manifested at the proper time, kairos idios. And in 2 Timothy 1.9, we read of God's purpose and grace, which were given us in Christ Jesus before age-long time, prachronon ionion, but now, noon, manifested by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus. Art and Gingrich render prachrononionion as before time began. Similarly, in 1 Corinthians 2, 7, Paul speaks of a secret hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages, prachrononionion, for our glorification. It was evidently a common understanding of the creation described in Genesis 1.1 that the beginning of the world was coincident with the beginning of time, or the ages. But since God did not begin to exist at the moment of creation, it therefore followed that he existed, quote-unquote, before the beginning of time. God, at least before creation, must therefore be a temporal. Thus, although the scriptural authors speak of God as temporal and everlasting, there's some evidence, at least, that when God is considered in relation to creation, he must be thought of as the transcendent creator of time and the ages, and therefore as existing beyond time. It may well be the case that in the context of the doctrine of creation, the biblical writers were led to reflect on God's relationship to time and chose to affirm his transcendence. Still, the evidence is not clear, and we seem forced to conclude with Barr that if such a thing as a Christian doctrine of time has to be developed, the work of discussing it and developing it must belong not to biblical but to philosophical theology. What is at issue here is God's relationship to time. Does God exist temporally or atemporally? God exists temporally if and only if he exists in time. That is to say, if and only if his duration has phases which are related to each other as earlier and later. In that case, God as a personal being has experientially a past, a present, and a future. No matter what moment in time we pick, given God's permanence, the assertion God exists now, were we to make it, would be literally true. By contrast, God exists atemporally, if and only if he is not temporal. 
This definition makes it evident that temporality and timelessness are contradictories. An entity must exist one way or the other and cannot, cannot exist both ways at once. If then God exists atemporally, he has no past, present, and future. At any time, uh, at any moment in time, it would be true to assert God exists in the tenseless sense of exists, as when one says the natural numbers exist, but not true to assert God exists now. Philosophical theologians have been sharply divided with respect to God's relationship to time. So we want to ask, what are the principal arguments which they have offered for divine timelessness and temporality, respectively? Before we look at those arguments, however, let me ask if there's any discussion of the biblical data. Uh, here's one from Christian Meister. Wouldn't defenders of divine timelessness have to hold that God eternally willed the creation of the universe? Yes, timelessly. Yes, that's right. He, he timelessly willed the creation of the universe. If they hold to God's unqualified timelessness, that's right. Any questions in class? I have a question. <clears throat> I noticed in the biblical data, the, um, there was a passage I kept looking for in here that, that you didn't address. I'd like to know how you address that is the passage in Revelation where Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Mm -hmm. Do you think the end would apply to, to time in that context? What do you I think? think that would be reading too much into it. That's probably talking about the beginning and the end of human history. Because after all, in the new heavens and the earth, time marches on. And there are more events that take place, and many are described. So. That's probably a reference to the beginning and the end of human history as we know it. Leonard Kraft online says, how does the biblical data related to the incarnation weigh in on whether God exists temporally or atemporally? Well, all sides would agree that the incarnate Christ is in time. There's no doubt about that. But the question would be whether or not that is compatible with the doctrine of divine timelessness. It, it's extraordinarily difficult to see how a timeless God could become incarnate in history. So that would be a real challenge for defenders of divine timelessness to um, address. So kind of responding to that, couldn't you just point to the fact that the Father, at the very, at the very least, is still um, what do you call it? Not like temporally like existent, I guess that's the right way to say it. Well, I think you're suggesting maybe the father is atemporal, but then the son becomes temporal. Yes. Yeah, uh, which but it's still, I think yeah, it's still uh, tricky. since they're both divine, that would require some sort of a model of divine eternity that would have to accommodate that kind of rift in the being of God. Um, which would, I think, be very difficult. Um, but again, that will belong to philosophical theology if someone's going to enunciate a doctrine of the incarnation of that sort. Okay. So is it possible, being that time is a created thing uh, with you know the beginning of the space-time continuum, um, that all of this is really just arguing about how many angels can dance on the head of the pen, so to speak, um, because God being timeless until creating time would still be timeless even if he interacts with the temporal world at the same time. That's what defenders of divine timelessness would say. But the question is, is that what the Bible teaches and as I say, the, the, the scriptural data seems overwhelming that God is everlasting and immemorial throughout time. Um, and so my claim is simply that that question can't be decided biblically. You're going to have to weigh the arguments for whether or not you think God can be timeless and still causally interactive with the world. 
so the, the Hebrew language itself is very ambiguous. Uh, words like olam, which is typically what's translated uh, to be eternity, uh, can also mean just the physical universe. Like if you say mm -hmm. in Hebrew, blessed is the Lord God, king of the universe, you would say, um, you would use the word olam in substitute of the universe. And so is it possible that all of this is really um, a graven misunderstanding in Scripture itself from the ambiguity of the word olam and ad? That might be the case. Um this similarly in the New Testament, although it speaks of chronos with regard to God, it also speaks of the ages, the ion, and that could be either the world or it could be time. But I think you're simply reinforcing the point that I'm basically making is that the scriptural data are not decisively on one side rather than the other. Um, and therefore it, it, it requires philosophical reflection if we're to decide this question. Now, of course, if one wants to simply rest with a biblical doctrine and affirm that God exists without beginning and end, fine, end of discussion, you know, <laughs> I'll go home. But if we want to know what God's relationship to time is, and I do, then I would like to reflect on this some more. So. The biblical doctrine is that God exists permanently without beginning and end, but it doesn't make it clear just how that is. Is he atemporal or is he everlasting throughout infinite time? Okay, so let's look first at arguments for divine timelessness. And I'm going to skip the first one on divine simplicity and go to 6.22 divine knowledge of future contingents. In contrast to divine simplicity and immutability, divine omniscience is clearly a great making property and enjoys considerable scriptural warrant. An argument for divine timelessness predicated upon God's omniscience would therefore have a more secure theological foundation. Many thinkers have argued that God's knowledge of future contingent <clears throat> events for example, future human free decisions implies divine timelessness. The reasoning seems to go as follows. One, a temporal being cannot know future contingent events. Two, God knows future contingent events. Three, therefore God is not a temporal being. Since temporality and timelessness are contradictories, it follows, therefore, that God is timeless. Despite the denial of two on the part of a wide range of contemporary thinkers, from process theologians to so-called open theists, a biblical doctrine of divine omniscience makes two incumbent upon an orthodox theologian. The argument hinges, therefore, on the truth of one. On behalf of one, it is usually claimed that contingent events, not being deducible from present causes, can be known only insofar as they are real or existent. Given two, it follows that future contingent events are real or existent for God. Defenders of divine timelessness, such as Boethius, Anselm, and Aquinas, thus typically maintain that all events in time are real to God and therefore can be known by him by his scientia visionis, his knowledge of vision. How could we make sense of this claim? The most plausible move for the defender of divine timelessness to make will be to hold that the four-dimensional space-time manifold exists tenselessly and that God transcends that manifold. A good many physicists and philosophers of time and space embrace such a tenseless view of time, sometimes called space-time realism. Such a view makes sense of the traditional claim that all events in time are present to God and therefore known to him via his scientia visionis. The drawback of this strategy, as we shall see, 
is that there is a high price to be paid philosophically and theologically for such a tenseless theory of time. Therefore, the claim that contingent events can be known only insofar as they are real or existent comes at a considerable cost for the Christian theist. One is therefore inclined to be skeptical of this justification for premise one. Moreover, one can be directly challenged as well. In assessing the question of how God knows truths about temporal events, uh, we may distinguish between two models of divine cognition, <clears throat> the perceptualist model and the conceptualist model. The perceptualist model construes divine knowledge on the analogy of sense perception. God looks and sees what is there. Such a model patently underlies the classic doctrine of scientia visionis and is implicitly assumed when people speak of God's foreseeing the future. The perceptualist model of divine cognition encounters real difficulty concerning God's knowledge of future contingents. For if future events do not exist, there is nothing there to perceive. By contrast, on a conceptualist model of divine knowledge, God does not acquire his knowledge of the world by anything like perception. His knowledge of the future is not based on his looking ahead and seeing what lies in the future. Rather, God's knowledge is more like a mind's knowledge of innate ideas. It is therefore inappropriate to speak of God's acquiring knowledge at all. Rather, as an omniscient being, God has essentially the property of knowing all truths. There are truths about future events, ergo God knows all truths concerning future events. So long as we are not seduced into thinking of divine foreknowledge on the model of perception, it is no longer evident why knowledge of future contingents should be impossible. We can go further, however. For the doctrine of middle knowledge is a version of the conceptualist model which allows us to say considerably more about the basis of God's foreknowledge of future contingents. Divine foreknowledge is based on one, God's middle knowledge of what every free creature would do under any freedom permitting circumstances, and two, his knowledge of the divine decree to create certain sets of circumstances and to place certain free creatures in them. Given divine middle knowledge and the divine decree, foreknowledge follows immediately without any perception of the created world. Um, and we'll see in our discussion of divine omniscience, uh, good reasons for affirming divine middle knowledge. So in sum, while the argument from God's knowledge of future contingents has some force in motivating a doctrine of divine timelessness, that force is mitigated by the availability of viable alternatives and the high price exacted by a tenseless theory of time. Any comments on this argument for divine timelessness? So this is a question I've always wondered. Uh, so on, on perfect being theology, it seems we have to affirm God knows all truths. Uh, counterfactual is a different discussion, like leave that alone. Doesn't, it's not part of the question. But do you think that knowledge of tensed facts is a requirement for omniscience? So yes. what I mean is that like, even though God might know future contingents, does God not knowing something is in the past or in the future as a tense fact limit his omniscience in some way? I think God must know tense facts, but not all of these tense facts are true at the same time. For example, it is now true that Columbus discovered America, past tense. 
But it is not now true that Columbus will discover America. That was true prior to 1492. Um, and prior to 1492, God knew that truth. But then it was false that Columbus has discovered America. So God didn't know that. Right. So then, uh, as you said, like if somebody has a timeless view of God, would yeah. this limit God's omniscience in some way? Because it would have to say he wouldn't know that yeah. in, in an intense way. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're, you're anticipating me, Hunter. <laughs> you're right. Yeah. All right, question from Jack Adger online. If God is atemporal, would some entities like angels be able to move in and out of time? I, I don't see how that's possible, Cameron, because if going in and out of time is an event, and therefore it would be dated, uh, and um, therefore the, the entity wouldn't be timeless. We had a follow-up on one of the questions that was asked in the biblical section from Christian Meister. He says, couldn't defenders of timelessness just say that he remained timeless with respect to his divine nature apart from his human nature? This is with respect to the incarnation. Correct. That's right. That, that is what I think they would want to say. They would not want to say that God the Son in his divine nature abandoned his timeless state and became temporal. Instead, they would say in his divine nature, the second person of the Trinity remains timeless and is timeless, even though his human nature is in time. But that, as I say, gets into these questions of the incarnation that we're not going to deal with. 